Deandra, come on down. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, and thank you so much for allowing me to come and speak to y'all today during the Wildscapes Day we're having here. Um, I know that we are focusing on native plants and getting our native plants into our spaces that surround our communities, including our homes and businesses and schools. Um, and you might be asking, why are you talking about bats? Um, well, one of the wonderful things that native plants do in our spaces is it allows our native wildlife to have a place to flourish. Um, and many people don't realize that bats are a huge part of our native wildlife right here in Houston. And when I say in Houston, I don't mean Katy or Conroe or Friendswood and all those outlying parts, even though bats are there too, of course. I mean right here inside the 610 loop. Um, I have friends that call themselves interloopers and they refuse to visit me out in Pearland because that <laughs> involves leaving the 610 loop, um, which I don't fault them for. And we have so many bats that act the same way. They're interloopers. Um, so they live here in the medical center, here on campus, at the zoo, in downtown. Um, and so anytime we can increase the native plants and increase the health of our spaces that surround these buildings, um, we're also helping bats, which makes me happy, because in case you haven't guessed, I'm really passionate about these little guys. They are hands down my favorite animal, so don't tell any of the other animals that, that I work with. Um, and as I grew to love them, I realized that in society, they can be somewhat malaligned. You always hear people say, oh, they're scary, they're creepy, they're Halloween animals. We shouldn't want them around. Right, they suck my blood. Um, and so as I grew to love them, I saw that I needed to be their champion a little bit and stick up for the underdogs, if you will. So that kind of led to my activism for bats. Now, as the slide behind me says, I do work at the Houston Zoo. So that is my full-time job. That is the job that pays the bills, although, you know, don't go into it for the money because you're going to be disappointed. Um, and it's a wonderful institution to work for because they truly promote you pursuing your passion. So when the Houston Zoo found that I had this passion for bats, they did everything to support it and allow me to grow it um, in a professional aspect. My other job is with the Buffalo Bayou Partnership and I work as a deckhand on their boats as a bat expert. So you can take a boat tour of Buffalo Bayou um, and you can take a specific bat boat tour and I will tell you everything you want to know about bats while on a boat. So I think that's kind of cooler than working at the zoo because I'm a bat pirate, if you think about it. <laughs> and like, how awesome is that? Like, you can't beat being a bat pirate. So today we are going to do a dive into bats. Um, and I never know where people are coming from with their bat knowledge. So I might have some of y'all out in the audience today that are mammologists and could tell me everything there is to know about bats as well. But I might have people in the audience today that think bats are birds. Spoiler, they're not. Um, so we are going to start off very basic. Um, and I'm sorry if y'all already know this information. Consider it review. And then we're going to get a little more advanced as we go. But again, I want to make sure that we're all on the same level from the beginning. So we're going to cover the basics. We're going to dive a little bit into what I call bat myths. Um, that is both in culture and in what I call science with quotes. Um, there's a lot of misinformation about bats out there. We're going to address some of those. And then we're going to end our time together talking about the benefits of bats and then also the bats that we have here in Houston that share our spaces with us. All right, so we're going to talk, start our talk by talking about bat classification. Now, like I said, bats are not birds, even though sometimes people tell me they are. They are mammals just like us. They belong to the class mammalia, and one of the things that makes a mammal a mammal is that we are all covered with hair of some kind. So fur, hair, two different words for basically the same thing. Um, and on the screen here, from left to right, you see an example of a Mexican free tail bat, an eastern red bat, and a hoary bat. Now all three of these little guys are Houstonians, 
and they are a really good example of the diversity of how bats can look. Um, so Mexican free-tail bats are that kind of dusty brown color you associate with bats, whereas the eastern reds, as their name implies, have a nice vibrant red color to them. And hoary bats, my personal favorite Houstonian bat, um, they look like they've been rolled in powdered sugar. <laughs> so the word hoary actually means white-tipped. So for instance, my husband has um, a salt and pepper beard, which I think makes him look very distinguished. And to annoy him, I say, you have a hoary beard. And he says, please don't say that. But hoary just means white tipped. Um, so that's how they got their name. I don't want anyone to think that they got their name in any other way. <laughs> now, another thing that makes a mammal a mammal is live birth. Um, so again, just like us, bats have live babies, they lactate, they feed their babies milk, and they are excellent mothers. They are not a litter-bearing animal. They do not have a horned uterus like a cat or a dog. Um, their uterus looks exactly like ours, so they have one pup a year, similar to the way humans typically have one baby a year. Um, occasionally, they can have twins, um, but that's very rare. Now, when a mama bat has a baby, at birth, that pup will weigh one-fourth her body weight. That would be like me having a 20-pound baby. Um, I had a five-pound baby, and that was enough. Like, I didn't want any more. Um, so that can speak to why they're not a litter-bearing animal. Um, one baby is enough. And they will take care of that baby to their detriment. Um, so again, if you're looking at litter-bearing animals like hamsters, gerbils, many times the, the mother will choose the runts and push them aside and maybe not take care of them as well. Um, bats won't do that. Even if a bat does have twins, um, she will take care of both of those pups equally. And if you know one of the pups is too weak to hold on, she'll just land and sacrifice herself and both of her babies to try to save both of them. So they are amazing little moms, um, which makes them even more endearing. And then, like all mammals, they're endothermic. Now, endothermic is just a big fancy word for warm-blooded. It means they can control their body temperature. Um, and that allows them to live in a variety of habitats. They are found on every single continent, with the exception of Antarctica, because really only penguins live there, and penguins are dumb, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but they can live everywhere else. Um, they even live up above the Arctic Circle in some places. Um, so they're extremely widespread on a global scale. So that was their class. To go even further down the classification tree, their order is Chiroptera. Now that's Greek for hand wing. And if you take a look at this wing structure right up here, you can see that those very delicate bones in their wing, those are actually their phalanges, their finger bones. Um, so when they're flying, most of their movement comes from their wrist. So they're flying with jazz hands, like that. When birds fly, most of their movement comes from their shoulder blade. They're kind of using their arm like a, a blade to push the air. Um, so the method with which, with which birds and bats fly is very different. Now, in the order Chiroptera, there's kind of an unofficial further classification of megabats and microbats. Um, this is more of a colloquial classification. It's not very scientific. For the most part, megabats are old world bats. So Asia, Africa, Australia. They're typically fruit eaters. And as their name implies, they're typically larger. Microbats are typically New World bats, so North America, South America. They're typically insectivorous, and they're typically smaller. Now, I keep saying the words typically because, of course, as with most things in science, you can find a lot of exceptions to these rules. So you can have a very small megabat that is smaller than the big, big microbat. But for the most part, those kind of generalizations apply. All right, so now a little bit about bat morphology. So we we're leaving classification. We're going to the little bat bodies, which are adorable. 
Um, so you can see the skeleton right in the center of the slide here. They have all the same bones that we do. So we've already talked about their phalanges. They have carpals, metacarpals, radius, and ulna. Um, it's just that their proportions are a little different. Now, many times when people look at the way a bat appears, they say, oh, they look like flying mice. They must be related to rodents because they have that little tail, they have those big ears. That's actually not the case. We already said that they belong to the order Chiroptera. They're the only living members of that order. But if you were to draw out a cladogram, the nearest branch to the order Chiroptera is actually the order of primates. So bats are more closely related to us than they are to rodents. Um, the rodent branch is kind of way over here. Um, so even though they're not a close cousin, if you had to say what a bat was related to, it would be the primates. Now, if you look at their faces, um, I personally think every single bat is stinking adorable. But again, I know I'm biased. If you look at the picture to the far left, those are the bats that get all the love on Facebook. Right? Those are what I call the puppy dog bats. They have the large eyes, they have that large snout, similar to a canine. Um, their ears are diminutive compared to other bats and set farther back on their head. Now the reason they have that facial morphology is because those are fruit-eating bats. They're not echolocating to find that fruit. They're not relying on their hearing. They're looking for that fruit with their eyes and they're smelling for that fruit with their nose. And that's why their faces look very much like a dog, because those are the two scents that dogs use most, is that their eyes and their sense of smell. The other bats here on this screen, even though I think they're adorable, some people look at them and say, uh, not so much. These two guys are insect-eating bats. So their eyes are diminished compared to a fruit-eating bat because they're not relying on their sense of sight as much. Their snout is diminished because their olfactory sense is not as important. So that way, um, over the thousands of years that they've evolved, um, their nose has become smaller and that part of their brain has actually become smaller. However, they have relied on their sense of hearing. So their ears have grown and that part of their brain has also grown in order to analyze those calls that they're hearing. Now, even this little guy in the center with that kind of funky nose thing, <laughs> Skin flaps, um, scientists have actually found that the skin flaps and folds on many insect-eating insect bats helps with echolocation. It aids in the kind of funneling of those sound waves back to their ears, and it just helps with the acoustics. So a lot of insect-eating bats will have either nose protuberances or weird folds and wrinkles all over their face, and that just helps them listen for their dinner at night. Speaking of dinner, bat diets. Bats eat a variety of things. Now since you are all plant people here, you'll be happy to know that there are many species of bat that pollinate. There are species of bat that eat nothing but nectar, similar to hummingbirds and butterflies. They live out west. So unfortunately, none of our Houston area bats are pollinators. Um, but there are many bats that are pollinators. Now, since bats are nocturnal, um, the plants they pollinate open only at night. They have large blossoms. They're white to reflect the, the moon. They're very fragrant, so the bats can smell their way to them. Now, if you ever partake of a margarita, think a bat, because they are one of the only pollinators of the agave plant. So I always think about them whenever I go to a Mexican restaurant. I pour out a little bit for the bats, you know, just, just to give them respect. There are also fruit-eating bats. Um, again, most of those live in what we call the old world, um, but they do us a huge service by eating that fruit, which we'll get into later. Now, this little guy here, he is having a good old time motorboating a cantaloupe. Um, he is at a rescue in Mineral Wells, Texas called uh, Bat World, and he, for whatever reason, cannot go back out into the wild, so we just feed him cantaloupe now, so he's a happy little guy. Of course, bats eat insects. They 
eat literal tons of insects a night. And that's not hyperbole. Tons of insects a night. Every single bat that we have here in Houston and in, in Houston eats insects. So if you see a bat in the Houston area, you're looking at an insect eater. Now take a look at those biddies over there. Those cute as button bats are vampire bats. So yes, there are bats that eat blood. However, they do not live here. All three species of vampire bat live down in Central America. None of them suck blood because they don't have the ability to suck. They don't have hollow fangs. They can't drink through a straw like humans. The way they get their dinner is they will make a small cut on that animal. When I say small, we're talking paper cut. Once that cut begins to bleed, they lap it up the way a dog will lap up water. There's an anticoagulant in their saliva, keeps a, the cut flowing for a little bit, and then they fly off. Nine times out of 10, the animal doesn't even wake up. Now there's a very specific reason that I chose that picture for those guys. Does anyone know what it is? Because they're cute, right? <laughs> now, I already said that bats as a whole are very maligned. They're already kind of starting behind the eight ball in public perception. So any time I can make an empathetic connection with an audience with a picture, something that makes them say, aw, before I tell them what it is, <laughs> It opens that door, right? They become much more receptive to hearing about them. Whereas if I had started with saying, I'm about to show you a picture of a vampire bat, that's already shutting you down. That's already making you say, oh, they're gross, they're horrible, they shouldn't even be around. So again, most of the pictures I put in this uh, presentation, I did so very intentionally. Um, and again, it's for that all connection to make you have an empathetic response to what I'm talking about, because that's when people truly start to care and have a behavior change. All right, back to diet. Sorry, I got off my soapbox. Um, and then also, bats can eat a lot that people don't even realize. So there's fishing bats. Um, the bulldog bat is a bat in North America that literally fishes. They will get over a lake or a stream. They'll kind of trail their feet in the surface of the water. It replicates insects hitting the surface of the water. Little minnows come up to eat the insects. The bats will make a really quick U-turn, come back, and then grab the fish out of the water. And then there are also some bats that eat small mammals, like mice. All right, so that was the bat basics. Now we're gonna go into bat cultures. I mean, bat myths. So we're gonna start talking about bat myths and cultures. Um, gonna do a quick time check here. I don't wanna get yelled at. Okay, we're good. All right, so bats have been present in cultures for many, many years. Um, and it's been both in negative and positive connotations. So, for instance, in Central and South America, many times they did have a, a more negative role in myths. Um, they were either seen as negative, flat out, um, bad, evil, or what I call negative neutral. And what I mean by that is even if they weren't necessarily doing things themselves, they were the messengers of things. So some cultures thought that if you saw a bat, it meant that your loved one was about to pass on because the bat was basically a messenger of the underworld coming to tell you someone's about to die. Um, and that would be considered a kind of a negative neutral. The bat themselves isn't killing anybody, but they're telling you someone's about to die. Um, and a lot of nocturnal animals throughout history had that negative to negative neutral role in our societies. And if you think about it, it makes sense. For the majority of human history, nighttime was a no-go zone, right? We didn't have electricity. We suck at seeing at night. We suck at getting around at night. And most of the time, if you left your little confines of your group, you got eaten by something out in the dark, and no one knew what ate you. Um, and so bats, owls, wolves, uh, in many cultures, were seen as mysterious because we did not know what they did out there in the dark. And how could they be active in the dark when we can't? Um, so again, that's where a lot of that came from. 
but thankfully now we have electricity <laughs> and we can see what happens at night um, and so we don't need to be quite as scared of our nocturnal friends. But in other cultures, bats did have a very positive connotation. So if the um, picture on the right here is from southeastern cultures and many saw bats as blessings. So they would put bat motifs on works of art and pottery and give it as gifts um, for a new baby or a wedding because it was a sign of blessing. Um, so again, kind of ran the gamut. But we still have bats in our cultures today, even though um, we have electricity. And these are two examples, right? So even today, we have bats in our culture. Um, some of it is negative to negative neutral, like Dracula, vampires, Halloween. Um, but the best superhero in the world, Batman, is a bat, right? Um, so that would be what I consider more of a positive role of bats in our myth culture. But even talking about Batman, like yes, he's a good guy, but he's kind of a shady good guy, right? Like some people would call him an anti-hero, like yeah, you're a good guy, but you don't always, like yeah, like you're kind of toeing the line there. Um, so even a good guy bat is still kind of seen as operating on the fringes. Now we're gonna go into fake facts, um, fake news, if you will. Now, what I call a fake fact are things that people have told me that they will put their hand on a Bible and swear it's true. And it doesn't matter what I say, they know it's true. <laughs> um, we get that at the zoo a lot, you know, um, and you do what you can, but sometimes you just gotta say, okay, have a great day. Because, you know, you don't wanna get into a fist fight at the zoo like I get fired. Um, so I'm going to address some of those now. Um, and the first one is bats are blind. I hear that a lot. And the number one reason that I hear that is because people say, oh, well, they echolocate. They're blind. Bats echolocate for the same reason that we use a flashlight. What's that? Because it's dark. You can't see. We don't use a flashlight because we're blind. We use a flashlight because there's not a lot of light. And that's the same reason bats echolocate. They're not blind. Their sight is comparable to ours. They can see, the light doesn't hurt their eyes. They can even see color. They echolocate because it's dark and that helps them find their food. Bats get caught in your hair. <laughs> Again, I've been working with bats um, since I was eight, 19. Um, many, many moons ago. Um, and I have always had long hair. I just recently chopped it off. My hair has been well down past my, my bottom before. I've never had a bat get caught in my hair, ever. They are extreme flyers. They are aerial acrobatists. They will not get caught in your hair because they look at us and say, oh, a human, ugh, and they don't want to be anywhere near me. Bats attack humans. I hear this one most in conjunction with people who go swimming at night. They say, oh, it was evening, we were swimming in our pool, and then out of nowhere, all these bats started dive bombing us and attacking us, and we had to run out of our pool. That probably happened. The reason it happened is because bats have to drink on the fly. They cannot land, crawl up to a puddle, drink from it, and then fly off. They have to find a body of water that has a large enough surface area for them to swoop down, skim the surface of the water while they're flying, drink while they're flying, and then go back up. So when they wake up, they're thirsty, like we are when we first wake up, and they're like, okay, I need to find a drink. And they look down and they see this huge body of water, and they're like, oh, that's perfect. They go down for a drink, and then they're like, oh, it's a human in the water. And the human screams, and the bat screams, and everyone screams. And then the humans run inside, and the bats fly off. And that's most likely what happened. They're not attacking you. Um, they don't want to attack you. There's no reason to attack you. Now, the caveat to that, as with any wild animal, you should never touch it, ever. Doesn't matter what it is. Bat, squirrel, raccoon, skunk. If you see a wild animal on the ground, don't 
touch it because humans are huge compared to them. We have forward-facing eyes, we stand upright, we have all the characteristics of an apex predator because we are. And then when we approach an animal on the ground, their first thought is, it is here to eat me. That's all they're thinking. And so anything is gonna bite and kick and scratch. So don't approach a bat on the ground and then I won't bite you. But bats do not attack humans. Bats have rabies, diseases, and are so dirty. Hear that a lot. Again, this is a fake fact, fake news. Um, they're not. They are extremely clean. They are fastidious when it comes to grooming themselves and others. They spend more time grooming themselves than most house cats do. They keep their fur impeccably clean. And I said they were related to primates especially the colony bats, the ones that live in those large, large colonies, they groom each other to build those social bonds. We have found that bats have friends, true friends, that are not familiar relations at all, and they spend time grooming each other and cleaning each other. They are extremely clean little creatures, and they're extremely disease resilient, so much so that scientists are trying to figure out why. When mammals get together in large congregations, we pass things around like wildfire. We are constantly making each other sick with colds and URIs and STDs. We pass things around to the nth degree, but we don't really see that in bats. Even bats that live in colonies 20 million strong, there's not a lot of sickness in those colonies. So scientists are trying to figure out why and could we somehow harness that in especially third world communities that have a lot of cholera outbreaks and other diseases go through those communities. Now for rabies. I'm not gonna stand up here and say no bats have rabies because that's a lie and I'm not gonna lie to you today. Bats can have rabies. So can you, so can me, right? Any mammal with the exception of possums really can have rabies. Um, but not all bats have rabies. And if you look at the population of bats as a whole, the incidence of rabies is actually really low. Um, so they kind of get a bad rap when it comes to the rabies card. And I hear that card played every day. Um, when I'm out at Wall Drive Bridge with the Houston bat team or doing my bat boat, that's the number one thing I hear. Are we safe here or will we get the rabies? Like, no, you're not gonna get the rabies. Um, and the bats that we see in that colony don't have the rabies. Um, if a bat has an active infection of rabies, it's going to die. Um, anything with an active infection of rabies is going to die. So they can have rabies. I'm not gonna tell you they can't, but so can a squirrel, so can a skunk, so can a fox. Now this is a picture of me doing a bat roost cleanup. And you see that I'm wearing a respirator there. Um, and I'm not wearing that respirator because the bats themselves are dirty. I'm wearing that respirator because we cleaned over 800 pounds of feces from an attic that was covered in dust. And you don't want to breathe that in. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, feces should never go into your lungs, right? Um, and that includes mouse, bat, human, just shouldn't go there. Um, so that respirator is just to keep my lungs free of those tiny airborne feces particles. All right, so now we're gonna go on to the bat benefits and talk a little bit more in depth about the bats that we have here in Houston, right outside these windows, I guarantee it. So bat benefits, they increase our biodiversity on our planet so much. They are the second most diverse group of mammals on the planet. Does anyone know the first? Yeah. No, there's not a mammal. Sorry. <laughs> rodents. So rodents, goodness, there's a crap ton of them. Um, but bats are the second most diverse group of mammals behind rodents. Um, and Peter Rieger, who works at the Houston Zoo, he's a rodent guy, so he always kind of likes to throw that in my face. I'm like, whatever. Um, and as you can see, on the, the map, they, they typically like to be in, in the warmer regions. Um, that's where you're gonna find the highest concentration of them, but they can even be found up above the Arctic Circle. Pest control. 
We already talked a little bit about how all of the bats that live here in Houston eat nothing but insects. They do us such a service by eating many things that go after our crops. Um, I always say that the, the bats here in Houston, they like to wake up and they'll kind of snack around this area. And they'll eat mosquitoes and other things that live in town. And I compare those to like chicken nuggets. And then a lot of our bats will actually head out west um, over the agricultural fields, like out in Katy area, um, because there's pests out there that eat all of those crops that are huge chunking moths. And the bats go out there to eat kind of in the middle of the night because those are like big meaty burritos. Like those are, those are meals, right? Um, and so they go out there, they eat all those moths while they're flying around, they eat on the fly, and then sometimes they stuff themselves so full that they go nap, you know, in the middle of the night, and then they wake up after their food coma, and then they kind of make it back into town. Um, but they do such a good job at controlling our pests. There's even wineries and farms in, uh, kind of in the central part of Texas that are installing bat houses around their crops in order to promote bats to just come and live there because it's a wonderful way to control pests that doesn't involve dousing our lands with chemicals. Because I know I'm preaching to the choir here, you really don't want to do that. Pollinators. Now like I said, there are bats that are pollinators. Not here in Houston, but out west. Um, and they pollinate a lot of plants. Many people don't realize that. I know that the pollinator poster child are the bees and the butterflies, because they're awesome as well. Um, but I don't think we give enough credit to our, our pollinator bats. Um, and, and they're cute little guys as well. One of the things that makes them such excellent pollinators is, and again, I'm sure you all know this because you're plant people, there are some insects that can rob nectar, right? So they can go down from like the base of the flower, drill a little hole, drink the nectar, not get any pollen on them. And it's like, what, really? Like, that was a low move, but whatever. Um, bats don't do that. Bats are kind of clumsy when it comes to eating that nectar. And they're mammals, so they're covered with fur, right? So they go up to a flower, they just like literally just dive into it. and. They're hairy, so this pollen's falling all in their face and all in their head, and they're just getting in there, and they're motorboating the flower. And then they go to the other flower and do the same thing, right? And so all of that hair actually makes them really good pollinators. And again, they're messy, so they're just getting that pollen everywhere, which makes the plant really, really happy. Seed dispersers. Now, these are the fruit-eating bats. Um, now, in ecosystems, there are many, many different types of seed dispersers. So birds and primates and lizards and pretty much anything that eats fruit can technically be a seed disperser. However, bats fill a really important role in that they're one of the only animals, especially in rainforests, that do not mind flying over cleared land. So what I mean by that is when you're looking at a, a tropical forest, um, those parrots and birds and primates and lizards, they're wonderful seed dispersers, but they help increase the density of the forest. They do not like leaving the canopy. They feel very exposed and not safe. So if you had a logging company, an agricultural company, clear a huge tract of forest, those animals don't really fly over that cleared land. They don't like to. Scientists have found that bats don't really care. So bats will fly over these clear tracts of land, poop out all of those seeds, and help increase the area of the forest, not just the density. And that's a very specific role that bats fill that is super important in today's world because, as I'm sure you know, we're not treating our forests quite as well as we should. All right, so bats of Texas and Houston. Now, I already told you that bats are my favorite animal. Um, and truth be told, I am a Texan at heart. Like, I am a Texas girl. I am one of those people that I will travel the world 
saying that Texas is the best state because it is. Don't let anyone tell you different. And it just so happens that the best state has the most amount of the best animal, bats, than any other state in the United States of America. So there you go. Like, what more proof do you need? We have 32 species of bat, more than any, anybody else. Um, and 11 of those species live here in Houston with us. So I consider myself highly blessed to be born in my favorite state with my favorite animal. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the species that we have heard at the Houston Zoo. Now I say heard instead of seen because it's literally heard. We have worked with Cullen Geiselman, who is a also on the board of the Houston Zoo, but then also on the board of Bat Conservation International, to start a research project listening to the bats that we have on zoo grounds. Um, and we have this very fancy acoustic wildlife monitoring device that we can put up in all inclement weather. Um, we put it up, we leave it running for four days. It's set to only record at night, obviously, when the bats are active. And this microphone listens and it records audio files on an SD card that is housed inside the computer. After four days, I collect the SD card and do what I call a data dump and analyze the files through a software. Now, thankfully, there's a software, because if I had to do this by ear, goodness, I don't even know. It wouldn't even be possible, because there can be well over a 1,000 audio files to analyze. The software will say it's trash, like it might be a cricket, or it'll say it's a bat. And if it's a bat, it'll tell us the degree of certainty of the species. What it doesn't tell us is the individual. So for instance, if during one night we had 10 Mexican freetail calls recorded, that could have been 10 Mexican freetail bats. Or it could have been one bat just screaming into the microphone. <laughs> and I kind of want to think that, because I, I can just see this little bat being like, Hello? Hello? What is, hello? What is it? Susan, what is this? Should I touch it? I don't know what this is. Like, that's what I think is happening. Um, but you never know. You never know. So these are the little guys that we have heard at the Houston Zoo. Now, the Houston Zoo is literally across the street. So all of the guys we're hearing at the zoo are going to be on the Rice University grounds as well. So on this screen, um, this first picture art is an evening bat. Then we have a hoary bat, again, my, my favorite Houstonian bat. Mexican freetail bat. And really quick, Mexican freetail bats, they're one of the most famous bat species because they congregate in those large colonies. So at Wad Drive, those are Mexican freetail bats. Congress <coughs> Avenue Bridge, Mexican freetail bats. Bracken Cave, Mexican freetail bats. And they get their name because if you look at this cute little tail right here, boop. It's a free tail. So all bats have a wing membrane. Some bat species, the wing membrane completely encloses the tail. But in other species, the tail pokes out. And so since the Mexican free tail's tail pokes out, that's how they got their name. And then we have the eastern, the northern yellow, which is closest to me, the eastern red in the middle, and then the silver-haired bat. Again. All of these guys have been heard hanging out at the Houston Zoo. It's a cool place to be. I like to hang out there, too. They could live there, or they could just be coming to hunt there. We don't know. Um, but it's quite possible they're living in our trees, they're living in our buildings, they're sharing that space with us every single day. And if we didn't put up this monitoring device, we wouldn't even know they're there. Um, and that's what I always tell people when they say, do you think I have bats in my neighborhood? I say, I guarantee you have bats in your neighborhood. You just never see them because they're really good neighbors, right? They don't bother us. They don't disturb us. They are just happy doing their bat thing and letting us go and do our human thing. Now, unfortunately, um, bats do need our help on a global scale. A lot of bats are either considered threatened or data deficient. Um, we are finding new species of bat every day. For instance, when I started at the Houston Zoo, um, which was in 2010, I think the species count was around 1150, and now it's 1390. So just in that 10-year time, that's how many bat species were put on the books. 
Um, whenever you're adding that many species, of course, many of those new ads are data deficient. We don't know enough about them to say whether they're doing good or, or poor. Um, and so they're definitely little guys that need our help. Um, they do have some threats against them. Habitat loss, bush meat, commercial trade. Um, yes, there are some areas of the world where people consume bats as part of the bush meat diet. Um, this little picture here is heartbreaking because it's a colony of fruit bats that was thrown in crates to be put off to market. Um, and so they're trying to stick their little hands out. Here in North America, we have white nose syndrome, which is a disease that has wreaked havoc on our bat populations. Um, it has been found here in Texas, unfortunately. It was found just this past year. Um, and it's kind of a wait and see thing. We don't know how it's going to affect our colonies because you see a lot of the mortality rates during hibernation periods. That's when most of the bats die from white nose syndrome is when they go to hibernate. Most of our bats don't hibernate. They either are active all year round because we're so warm or they migrate. So it's yet to be determined how white nose is going to affect them. And then wind turbines also do a number on bat populations, especially out in the West Texas area. But it's never doom and gloom, right? Ever. There's always something we can do. And I always want to leave people with what they can do. I always tell people, the only time you should be sad is if something goes extinct. Because as long as they're still here, there's still a chance to help. And bats are still here. So you should never be sad about what's happening to bats. We just need to help them get better. Now, everyone in this room is already ahead of the game because one of the things I tell people to do is plant native plants. Make your spaces be habitable to wildlife. Anything you do to help pollinators, you help bats, right? Because you're strengthening these ecosystems from the ground up. You're putting bat plants that should have been here all along. You're not putting chemicals on your plants that harm so many creatures. So just by being here today, you are bat heroes, and I thank you. My hat's off to you. You can also do things like put up bat houses. Um, I hope they come. Of course, they have their own agenda. So if you put up a bat house and no one moves in right away, don't yell at me. Just give it a few years, they'll come. Um, and then, of course, like I said in the beginning, bats can be very maligned. So anytime you can talk to loved ones and friends and colleagues about how awesome bats are, you truly help them. And most importantly, remember, like they've been bats for millennia without our help. Like they don't need our help being bats. They just need us not to hurt them. And that's how we can truly make an impact. All right, what's my time like? You are good. Am I like right on the money? Right on the money. Right on the money. <laughs> All right, so now we are opening for the question time. Um, and before we open for questions, the bats up here, the white ones are Honduras tent-making bats, and they literally look like cotton balls their entire lives. They never not turn white, and they make <coughs> tents out of palm fronds. Um, so they're an amazing little bat to talk about. We have, a, we have a question right there. While Wally's trying to figure out how to turn this thing on, I'll, I'll go help him. I, I, I love your talk. Um, one of the questions I have is on the bat house, I have one. My neighbor was terrified of them, but um, he has since moved, so now <laughs> I'd like to put That's it up. That's one option. Let's make everyone move. Well, well, no, I didn't put up the bat house, but where is a good place to put up the bat house? So it's not an exact science, as I'm sure you know with most things in nature. Um, <laughs> If you have, like, look at the area around your house and think about what they'll need. So like I said, they want to look for a place to drink when they first wake up. So if you, like, if your neighborhood you has a creek or a drainage ditch, like two houses down, put your bat house facing that, you know. Um, other things you can do, typically the higher the better. Um, if you can mount it on a pole instead of a tree, that can be good as well. Um, if you get on Bat Conservation International's website or Bat World's website, they can give you some tips as to paint color and height and things like that. Um, but unfortunately, it's just something you kind of have to do and tweak um, and see what works best. I know people that have put up bat houses, and it was seven years before anyone moved in. 
But I know other people that put up a bad house and the next night they had bats. <laughs> so they definitely have their own agenda and timeline. And you, all we can do is try. Uh -huh. So we got one right back here. Uh, what I wanted to do is tell everybody to make sure to come down on Friday nights to the Wall Street Bridge, bring your family and friends, the bat team, has, uh, they'll take you up under the bridge to see them in the crevices before they emerge for the evening. So you can go on the website and see it, but it's free. And we can handle 300 people, and it's really fun. You get to see all the bats emerge and go out. It's really neat, and it's completely safe going under the bridge, under the crevices, but just don't, don't open your mouth and look up. <laughs> Yep, and that's, um, and there's Alamo Burger House right next to there. Yeah, the Alamo Bell Springs Burgers. Cafe. <laughs> yes. That's yes. a mile away from my cottage there. Yeah, so good. Oh, we have Burgers. a question up here. Yep. So if you put up a bat house, what is the most likely type of bat you'll have, and how many will end up in the house? Um... The most likely type would probably be Mexican free tails. However, they're not um, too picky when it comes to living around other species. So you can have more than one species and have it one bat house. Um, if you have a bat house that has like three to 500 bats in it, and I know that sounds like a huge number, but it's not. Mexican free tails love to cram their little bodies and live with their closest friends. Um, whereas Eastern reds are typically more solitary. So Eastern reds like to live in Spanish moss and they're not a colony bat. So it just kind of depends. Okay, we yeah. got a question over here. Oh, yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the vampire bats, you showed us a, a picture of, of the cute ones, and uh, they seem to have really well-developed large ears. Uh, so is, do you think that's an evolutionary thing, that they used to be in eat insects and so then that some... the picture I showed were uh, and again I did this on purpose they were the babies um, and so a lot of times when you look at baby animals their feet are large and their ears are large um, the the adult vampire bats don't have those large ears because they kind of grow into their ears oh. if you will you uh -huh. know so their um, proportions were a little little off um, but yeah great thanks mm -hmm. okay who has the next microphone here right there okay do you tag bats to document their travels? Um, I've heard of some studies that have done bat tagging with, uh, with varied success. Um, personally, I haven't been involved in any studies that have done bat tagging. I've primarily done more monitoring studies. Got a question right here. Yes, I have a, uh, like a pool umbrella that we leave mm -hmm. closed and occasionally we'll go to start to open it and they're sleeping in there and we'll leave it closed at that time. Is there a way to keep them from doing that? I just don't want them to get hurt and get squashed if I don't see them. Right, um, most of the time when that happens, so whenever bats go out and hunt for the night, it's not like a, an eight hour marathon of flight, right? They fly, they hunt, they rest, they nap, they fly, they hunt. And so many times when they end up in those umbrellas or if like you'll see a random one on the side of a building, what's happened is that they, they've stopped for a nap and they've overslept. And they wake up and they're like, oh crap, the sun's up. Like, uh, I'm gonna stay here. And like they just kind of stay and then that's why typically the next day or the next night they're gone. Because once that sun goes back down, they're like, okay, I'm gonna go home now. Oh, I'm gonna be in so much trouble. Um, so they're not, like, they're not going to get hurt there. Like, it's fine. Um, many times I say, like, if you can leave your umbrella open during the night, it's not going to provide those little nooks and crannies that they like to get into. But they, they're typically fine. Okay. There's a lady in a green, light, lime green jacket that's been really patient. <laughs> what is the size of a body of water? Uh, you said a swimming pool would attract mm -hmm. bats, but... Is there like some surface area? Because I have a pond and I would love to yeah. see that. Yeah, so typically enough. ponds are fine. Because um, even out in West Texas, they'll have bats go for um, troughs, 
like the the troughs they put out in like uh, for pastures for cattle. Um, the troughs can be a little tricky. So if you think about a trough, they're typically what like four feet long ish, um, and I think that's kind of the the lower limit because even with a the trough, they have seen some instances where like a they can tell a bat has come down and then like hit the side and then falls in and drowns. Um, and so one of the kinds of uh, wildlife saving opportunities that we do out in West Texas is we put uh, nets that hang in to the troughs and not, it helps not just the bats but any wildlife that's going for a drink and falls in because it gives them something to crawl out on. Um, but yeah, like if you have a pond or a creek or anything like that, I'm sure that's fine. This lady in a blue shirt. Uh, Wally, um, could you come down here? We got some down here. Go I ahead. have about 60 bats in my chimney, and they're really neat. We watch them at night, but it looks like there's a few less now. Once they have their pups, do some move on? or They can, so especially if it's a migratory colony. So like Mexican free tails, a lot of colonies of them move on. So like if you've been to Austin, the ones in Austin migrate down to Mexico, and then they come back. Um, so after they have their, their pups, they can migrate, move on. Um, sometimes bats will abandon a roost, and we're not sure why. Um, so they probably just found a new home. Are, well, you, are you happy with them there? Oh, are you trying I to am. It got a little nerve-wracking when we would have to catch them in the house and oh, yeah. take them out <laughs> to the table so they could. Right. But when I found that they were coming down through a little crack, I just put tape over it. and Perfect. We're good. Yeah, perfect. Good. I always tell people, like, your house is your house, right? So I'm never going to sit here and tell you you can't evict a bat. Like, it's your house. Like, you can do what you want with it. But I ask you to do it responsibly. Um, evict them. Don't eradicate them. There's a difference. And evict them at the right time of year. Um, don't evict a mom when, she's had, when she has a baby inside because the baby will starve to death because the mom can't get back to her. And then the mom will basically die trying to get back to her pup. So there's certain times a year where you can safely evict bats from your house. And if you do it during that time, they kind of leave for the night. They can't get back in because you put a one-way valve on their entrance point, And then they just go find a new home. Like, no harm, no foul. Wally's going to bring a microphone here and then there. You had said something about not picking up a bat. But if you see a bat on the ground, what do you do? Who do you contact? Um, so the best thing to do, of course, never pick it up. Um, most bats, especially here in Houston, when they get grounded, they can't take off from the ground. So like if there was a bat right in front of me, the first thing he would do is he would start crawling to try to find a tree or a wall to kind of, or even like this tablecloth. He would like crawl up and then he'd get to about here and then they push off and then drop and fly. So many times people see a bat grounded here in Houston. They see it not taking off, not <coughs> flying, and then they think to themselves, oh, they can't fly. Oh, they can't get up. Um, so if you're somewhere like walking and there's trees nearby, the best thing to do is kind of watch it um, and help it get towards a tree off the path so they don't get stepped on. And then once they're at that base of the tree, nine times out of 10, you'll see them start climbing up the tree. At that point, they're good. Like, they don't need any more help. Um, if you see a bat that appears to be massively injured or in distress, um, make sure it's safe. Make sure that it, like, no one else is going to come up to it. And then there's lots of wildlife rehabbers that are rabies vaccinated that can come and assist you. Don't call animal control or pest control because they're, they're going to come euthanize it and then test it for rabies. And the only way you can test something for rabies is to kill it. Um, so, yeah. Right, right here. In my house, um, when they would end up on the house, they would take a big plastic bag, put it over it, and then slide it over the lady, and then take them out. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you, I'm sorry, the, you talked about evicting them at the right time in one-way valves. <clears throat> Where do you get people who can come and put something up that will help keep? Because we have a, a cupola that I want to put up a bat house, but I'm afraid to attract them for fear that they're going to get up in there and then come down in the house. There's a few companies around that can assist you with that. Um, and again, if you go to Batworld website, 
um, I think it's batworld.com. They're located in Mineral Wells. She works with a network of people around Texas to have bat-friendly practices and companies that can help you with that. Okay. Uh, I own a, a, a farm down in Wharton County, and I've had it since 1993. And in that time, I have never seen a single bat. I am just amazed that I'm, I'm this is, I find this lecture very fascinating because I, this is an animal that I've never ever seen down there. And I have huge uh, cottonwood trees, sycamore trees, pecan trees. And where do the bats stay if they're not under a bridge, living under a bridge? Do they, uh, do, do they, uh, do they sometimes uh, uh, build nests in trees? They love to live in trees. Um, so like, for instance, the eastern reds, they live in clumps of Spanish moss. Northern yellows love to live in palm fronds, um, especially kind of dry yellow palm fronds. They love to get up in there and roost. They can roost under bark in certain species of trees. Um, so they live in so many different types of roost sites. Now, they, it's hard for us to see them because they don't make a nest the way a bird would. You know, it's like if you're walking under a tree and you see a bird nest, you're like, oh, look, birds live there. Um, bats use the structures that are available to them. So just because you don't have a bridge or some other cave-like structure around you, um, they are living in those trees and in any kind of those natural areas around your... <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> so this is my, my bat friend. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah. And, and then remember, just because you don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. Uh, you can actually get online um, and buy, I'm going to disappear beneath the table real fast. Um, the, the acoustic monitoring thing we use at the zoo, very official, very scientific, and very expensive. Like, don't buy this. It's expensive. But you can go on to other websites and you can buy these little dingle hopper doodads that you can literally put into an iPad or an iPhone or a tablet, and it will listen for bat calls and tell you the species of bat that you're hearing. Um, and these wow. things are very accessible. They're very affordable. And so I would challenge you to go out one night on your property, get one. get one of these things, and just sit there and see who you're hearing. Because again, you're not going to see them. Fascinating. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple more questions, three more questions or so. Oh, one up here. I, um, I have an owl box in our yard, and I don't want to attract bats if the owls will eat the bats. <clears throat> is that a thing, or do I need to worry about that? It can be a thing, but it's nature. Attract bats. Uh, symbiosis. You got there both, you go. both ends mean, working. How amazing would it be if your backyard space was healthy <clears throat> enough to have native plants and native <coughs> insects and native owls and native bats and like you had this whole little thriving ecosystem in your backyard. Um, I do get asked that a lot actually. They're like, oh well, you know, what if I want to keep bats away because I have too many owls? It'll balance itself out and bats are really good at avoiding the things that want to eat them just like any wild animal is. If you come down to Wall Drive Bridge to watch those emergences, we have a family of swains and hawks that live there and every night, it's like National Geographic. And I mean, you see the hawks like swooping and getting bats, and the crowd will be like half the crowd's cheering for the hawk, like, oh, it got the bat. And then like the other half is cheering for the bat, like, get away, little guy, get away. And like, even though it hurts me because bats are my favorite, like, I know it's, it's what's supposed to happen. Like, that's how it's supposed to happen. What are the largest and smallest kind of bats? Um, globally? So smallest bat globally is a kitty hog nose bat, also called the bumblebee bat. It can fit on the end of your thumb. Its little body is never longer than an inch. It's the smallest mammal in the world. For a while there, there was a contest going between it and a little pygmy marmoset, but haha, -ha, the bat won, and it now has the <laughs> smallest mammal in the world title. The largest bat are the Indian flying fox species, which are again, Australia, Asia. They can have a wingspan of over nine feet, and like if they were standing next to me, it would stand like this tall. Those are big boys, and they eat nothing but fruit. Okay, we got time for one more question. Come on, who wants to? 
Jaime Gonzalez Jaime. comes to the rescue. All right, that little dingle doodad that you were talking about. Uh -huh. I know that there are some programs that will transmit what you hear to a, da a database so that scientists will know where these bats are occurring. Do those do that, or if not, is there another thing that you can get? Um, these typically don't do this, do that, um, but I do know there's websites that you can do citizen science with. Um, so you can go in and log what you hear. I'm not sure where you could buy the ones that do the direct link up. Thank you, Deandra, that's been a great presentation. You all enjoyed it.